Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Dubbed Energy Transition. My name is Eunice Brichum, an Associate Director at Deloitte, and I'll be your moderator for this morning's event. Let's take note of a few housekeeping rules before we get started. We would like to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Deloitte YouTube page. Currently, all participants have been muted However, during the Q&A session, you can raise your hands and you'll be unmuted to speak. You can also drop all your comments and questions in the Q&A chat box on your screen. A survey link will be put in the chat box for you to provide us with your feedback getting to the end of the webinar. And to make the session more interactive, we have created polls for your feedback on issues in the industry. Without wish, wasting much more time, I will hand over to Mr. Gideon Ayiowu, who is our Energy Resources and Industrials Industry Leader, to kickstart the webinar. Gideon. Thank you very much, uh, Eunice, and a warm welcome to all our participants for today. And uh, we look forward to a very uh, uh, engaging discussion. And um, we are very much, um, as I say, in terms of the energy, we see its impact on our everyday lives from our waking up uh, to going to work and the work we do. And uh, it encompasses all areas of our lives. Um, it's, it's so critical that whenever there is a, a blip or an issue, uh, it, it becomes a, a topical uh, matter. And in, in this stage where we are now, we all, we've all been seeing the recent droughts and the recent uh, issues about flooding and so on, all these have climate change impact. And these are all coming from how energy has been utilized over the years. And for today, we are coming to talk about an aspect of our lives. Again, that is quite important, energy and what, how, how, how uh, the transitioning to uh, the cleaner fluids and how this impacts of our everyday lives. And uh, when you check out on Ghana's energy policy, it, it has uh, um, various, uh, aspects uh, on this area. It's talking about costs and uh, affordability of energy, uh, electricity, how we utilize it, and then also the transition. So quite recently, we've been hearing about what government's policies are uh, in terms of nuclear energy, uh, having various renewables, uh, clean energy, etc., and gas and so on. And all this is to make sure that we have this uh, uh, power available to ourselves and that it is not just available, but it's cost effective. Because if you look at other government uh, uh, areas, for example, we had this you know, one district, one factory. If we don't have energy available, most of these policies will not be realized. It's also having an impact on our medical health, et cetera, and even our Greek. We are talking about dams, uh, pumping water, irrigation, and so on and so forth. So it's much evident to us how important energy is to our everyday lives. And so here today, we are we have uh, assembled a good number of panelists to look at some of these policies and the regulations and, that, and how uh, uh, the future is going to look like so that we are better informed uh, in making uh, our daily decisions. Um, we would also like to know what success will look like as in terms of our, our, strat our strategic initiatives and where we are heading to and what can we count on to ensure that, hey, uh, all these things that we said we are going to achieve, this is what we are doing and that is how we are going to look at. And uh, as part of this energy transition to, we also have to look at um, the, the impact that uh, local businesses or Ghanaians can play in this aspect, because we are all very much witness to how the effect of global uh, uh, price fluctuations affects the cost of uh, power here. And so it's very important that we should be able to localize some of this uh, uh, content so that it wouldn't have a negative impact or the global pricing, et cetera, would not have a negative impact uh, on our economy in terms of inflation, et cetera. And as we do so, we uh, get to create jobs 
livelihoods are improved and then we get to do all the things that, that, that we want to do. So um, I'm looking forward to a much uh, 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 in-depth discussion of a lot of these areas. And also hopefully we'll be able to answer most of the questions that uh, you, the audience have. So at this juncture, I would like to introduce uh, uh, our honorable uh, deputy minister in charge of energy. Uh, we are very grateful to have him here in spite of his uh, busy schedule and he's traveling, he's made time uh, with us here to share uh, uh, some of this things. And so he's, as I mentioned, he's a deputy minister in charge of energy. Uh, he represents the people of uh, 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 North, if, is it Fija Kwabre North? Yes, yeah, sorry, I hope I got it cor correct. And uh, he's in parliament, but most importantly, he's here in, uh, as a minister of energy and to share some of these policy initiatives and what the rules and regulatory uh, regulations look like. So at this point, I would like to hand over to Honorable Collins Eduma Komensa. Thank you very much. Yes, um, good afternoon from where I am. I'm currently in Kenya, uh, Nairobi. So Honorable, over to you now. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon from where I am. I'm currently attending the US-Africa Nuclear Energy Summit uh, here in Nairobi. Uh, last year it was held in Ghana. Uh, this year it's taking place in Kenya. Uh, we moved to Rwanda um, next year. Uh, I believe what is happening here in Nairobi, Kenya feeds into the subject matter of energy transition. And let me begin by, by, by making some very, very interesting comments. Uh, you know, when I, when I finished university, I applied for a job at Deloitte. Uh, I'm sure my, my application is still somewhere in there. And uh, when I got the invitation to, to speak at this event, uh, it brought some, some memories of my earlier attempts to work with such a prestigious institution. Uh, but as fate will have it, uh, today I'm here uh, discussing energy transition uh, with, 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 with um, very esteemed guests um, that we have. Now, I will be, be focusing my attention on the financial implications uh, of the energy transition as per your, 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 your subject matter. Um, I, I must state from the onset that government uh, has its aim to reduce greenhouse gases through decarbonizing all sectors of the country and also to improve its energy access, efficiency, security, uh, and energy transition framework. It is important that I also emphasize that government is dedicated uh, to this whole energy transition uh, program. And so has put together, if you recall in 2023, uh, what we call the national energy policy. Uh, and then key aspect of this national energy policy is the issue of energy transition. And the key element of our energy transition roadmap um, uh, includes that we increase our renewable energy sources by 10% into the energy mix by 2030. Uh, we improve upon our energy efficiency and conservation initiatives. Uh, we establish strong regulatory environment to draw in the, cap the private capital and then promote energy cooperation and integration across regions via programs such as the West Africa Power Pool. And just this morning, before I rushed to join this uh, program, Ghana has just signed a cooperation and a cooperation and framework agreement with the United States of America, uh, which is aimed at um, uh, putting together a framework. And it was done between, Ghana was represented by our nuclear um, Ghana, the, the, the nuclear Ghana, and then Regnum uh, from the United States of America. We just signed a cooperation agreement uh, to, to put together a framework and set out a framework as we move 
to fully operationalizing our nuclear uh, program. Let me just dwell on some of the initiatives uh, that we, uh, we've, we've embarked on. Um, we just lifted the ban on wholesale electricity supply permits for renewable energy projects, which has made it possible for the private sector to participate in the markets, which is very, very significant. Uh, we have created a, a Ghana Energy Transition Office, and I just saw that my, my very good friend um, Bradley is on the panel, and I'm sure he's going to throw more light uh, on this subject matter. Uh, we launched the National Energy Transition Framework and Investment Plan, which outlines a clear pathway to a net zero emission by 2016. Uh, and the whole idea of this initiative is to create an enabling environment for energy transition, attract investment, and ensure that the benefits of the transition are shared equitably across societies. Now, financially, there are some implications. Um, the energy transition presents both some challenges and opportunities. While we all know that the initial cost of switching to renewable energy and implementing energy efficiency measures can be very, very high. Um, it is anticipated that in the long run, the benefits in terms of lower energy costs, increased energy security and environmental sustainability are, 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 will, 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 will be achieved in the long run. Uh, we're also working very closely with financial institutions and development partners, as just happened today in Nairobi, uh, to mobilize the resources required for the transition. Uh, this, as I said, includes looking for new financing mechanisms like the green bonds, climate funds, and public-private partnership. We're also committed to ensuring that the transition's costs do not fall disproportionately on consumers and businesses, particularly those in the vulnerable sector. So before I, 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 I conclude and allow others to also come in, I just want to assure you that the government is fully, fully committed to this whole idea of energy transition and is taking concrete steps uh, to drive it forward. Today, for the past three days, as I said, I've been in Kenya and on nuclear and Ghana's name has been uh, has been popping up, all participants keep mentioning Ghana, right from in Kume's days, the issue of nuclear um, had come up and thankfully uh, we, we seem to be seeing some very, very interesting and uh, rapid progress ongoing within that sector. And so government is really, really committed to ensuring uh, that we participate fully in this whole energy transition. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Adomaku Mensa, for your very insightful remarks. Um, it was very interesting to hear what um, some more about what government is doing to uh, promote the energy transition uh, for the country, and also uh, collaboration and cooperation, not only uh, within the region, um, but with the donor, donor community and with um, other parts of the continent as well. We're very grateful uh, for your remarks. Now, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Eko Kofi. Uh, Eko is a senior manager in the energy consulting team here at Deloitte, and he will be giving us a presentation on energy transition. So, Eko, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Eunice. Um, let me quickly share my screen. So I think um, the um, Honorable Deputy Minister did some very good job on um, highlighting government's efforts um, towards um, our commitment to the energy transition 
plan. What we want to do ahead of the panelist discussion is to um, educate our audience, bring you to speed on what really is in the um, energy transition framework that Ghana has developed and which the Honorable Deputy Minister also threw some light on. So basically, um, there's a global shift towards more environmentally um, responsible and resource efficient sources. And this has resulted in the need for um, a lot of discussions on um, global commitments, countries' commitment to our um, climate reduction and achieving the net zero um, emissions goal. So there's this research institute called Mercata Research Institute. What they've done is they've looked at um, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions or equivalent in the atmosphere. And they have quantified it and estimated how long it will take before we achieve the target of either 1.50 degrees Celsius or two, two um, degrees Celsius. And, and basically beyond this, you will expect um, severe climate um, um, effects. Now, what it means is that as business as usual, if nothing is done and the rate at which we are emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for a target of 1.5 degrees Celsius, we have only four years left. So beyond four years, we should expect severe impact and consequences of the climate to our way of life. Um, for looking at looking at the two um, degrees Celsius target, we have 22 years. Now, what happened that in 2015, when they set up the Paris Climate um, um, Commitment um, among 196 countries, the, the earlier goal was to look at two, two, two degrees Celsius, right? But recently, world leaders are stressing that this needs to be limited to 1.5 because um, when when you want to delay to the two degrees Celsius, the impact could be could be severe, and and we are seeing that clearly. We have just four years left if nothing is really done. So, in twenty fifteen, the UNCC framework, made up of one ninety six parties, signed up um, or made a commitment to reduce. As I said, the initial one was to reduce the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius, right? But in recent discussions, there's the goal to bring it below to further down to 1.5. But from what we are seeing, that's gonna be a hard nut to crack because I mean, with barely four years left, I mean, what can we do even um, as, as um, when we have all parties involved? Now, the interesting thing about the Paris Climate, it, it provides a framework for basically three amps, right? Which are very key to realizing the commitments to the um, reduction or achieving the necessary emissions goal. First, finance is very critical. I mean, we talk a lot about energy transition. How are we going to finance it? So it provides a framework, right, that developed countries must lead in that effort. So we saw um, some commitment from the recent COP where um, we some countries actually came out to, to place some funds for the loss and damage funds. Um, certainly, I mean, to also beyond the funding, there will be the need to innovate. There will be the need to um, change the way we do things. And certainly we cannot do that without technological advancements. I mean, we have EVs, we have hydrogen technologies, we have carbon capture utilization. So we also need to, need to support um, the technical um, um, advancement to see how um, this, this goal can also be realized. And then lastly, capacity building, right? There is the need for capacity building. Recently, with the recent law that have, has been passed on um, the carbon emissions target levy in Ghana, I mean, clearly countries need to um, have, um, or, or basically countries need to have um, 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 basically build that capacity to be able to reduce their um, carbon emissions um, um, goal. So NDCs, when we talk of NDCs, we are 
<laughs> we are not talking about a political party, NDC. NDC means the nationally determined contributions. Um, what it does is that the Paris Agreement also enables countries to set their own targets. It does not impose. So it gives countries that opportunity to go ahead, set their target. Every five years they come, they renew it, right? So you have Ghana, for instance. Ghana did the first one in 2015. And then after a five-year cycle in 2021, Ghana I am renewed its target. And the expectation is that every five years, these targets must be ambitious so that we can, we can demonstrate that we are making that effort to achieve that uh, net zero um, commitment. So what did Ghana do, right? Right now we have the NDC, right? So as part of um, pre preparation towards the COP26, Ghana set up the National Energy Transition Framework. Basically what the Energy Transition Framework does is to, among a host of um, um, objectives, primarily to achieve carbon neutrality by 2070 and then, um, emphasize these terms, energy security, economic growth, and social inclusion, because you cannot prioritize energy transition when these things are in compromise. Then it's like you are just going back um, um, five steps and then coming back um, 10 steps, right? So it says, it says um, five key objectives um, for the framework. Now, in developing the, these um, um, the energy transition goals, what was done is there was a lot of stakeholder engagement. There was also some modeling um, 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 efforts by the government, the government team responsible for that. And um, these were the five objectives that they set up. First, identify viable pathways to how the transition will be met. Right. Um, two, also, yes, we want to meet the transition, but we need to do it in a very fair and equitable manner. Um, evaluate the impacts. I mean, in the later in later slides, you see that, and I think the Honorable Minister also mentioned it, the, 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 the plan to achieve the energy transition is not all positive. There are some um, um, disadvantages when the the impact or the, the framework is not um, wholly analyzed and then develop medium to long-term targets and policies. The goal is for 2070. So how do we achieve it every five years? And then what is the cost? So we have talked about all of this. We said we need funding from developed countries. How much do we need? So these were the objectives that were laid out to develop the Ghana Energy Transition Framework. And after several, after, after several work, um, this this is basically the highlights. Okay. This is basically the highlights. One um, is a long-term framework, right, up to 2070. That means that even though the global target is to look at to, um, net zero by 2050, Ghana has set um, its target up to 2070. Um, also, um, it, it focuses or it proposes the need to have diversified fuel mix, prioritizing natural gas and nuclear energy. And I think the Honorable Deputy Minister also spoke about that in his keynote address. Um, it talks about long-term cost. So yes, there's gonna be significant investment that is gonna be required in, in realizing the energy transition. But the expectation is that in the long-term, we should see a um, reduction in, in end-user electricity costs to, to the consumer, because if after all of these investments, electricity is going to be expensive and, and virtually everything is going to be expensive, then what really is the, is the long-term benefit, right? Um, and then also minimizes energy-related indoor air pollution. And then require, so, so this is the highlight of it. The, the, the framework was able to estimate that in order to, to achieve these goals, um, prioritizing all the um, disadvantages and the mitigation and even adapt adaptation measures, it will require $562 billion. So, in terms, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, there was a notice that the Honorable Minister, the Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, Honorable Adama Komensa, unfortunately has to um, participate in a session um, in Nairobi, where he's at. And uh, there were some questions that came up that okay. we would like to him to address. So um, we'll um, please 
you know, step aside from a, a, a scheduled agenda here and permit him to um, have the opportunity to respond to these questions and then and then we'll continue and get into the panel session. That's fine. Okay, thank you very much. So Honorable Aduma Kumensa, um, there are a couple of questions that uh, came up that have been addressed uh, to you following your, your keynote address. Um, the first one says that following the discussions on the new collective quantified goal, NCQG, what is Ghana's position? Because the assessment in terms, is what's the assessment in terms of trillions or billions of dollars? Because as was just mentioned um, by my colleague, and as you mentioned in your uh, remarks, um, according to the Energy Transition Investment Plan, uh, we need about $550 billion to achieve uh, net zero. So um, basically, you know, how how are we going to address this? Thank you. Well, obviously, uh, Ghana cannot afford $500 billion on its own. And that was why it was important for us to transition from a framework to a plan to attract investors into the space. Just today, what happened here in Nairobi, where we signed this cooperation agreement, is basically to give an opportunity to private sector to participate in this uh, nuclear space. Um, already, discussions are far advanced. I know the president will be visiting China um, uh, next week, and the whole idea is to finalize discussions with our Chinese partners for a vendor. Uh, for a BOOT arrangement um, to, to take place. Um, the, uh, the, the Americans are also very, very keen on uh, the other aspects um, of, of after the construction of the nuclear plant. So obviously Ghana cannot do it on its own. And that is why uh, we've kept on engaging our development partners and financial institutions to assist in this whole process. Now we are talking 2020 to 2060 indeed initially, we were looking at 2017. It was when the plan was finally agreed on uh, that we brought it to 2016. And so the 500 billion we are talking about is not a lump sum that we need at this particular moment in time. It is a calculation or um, um, appraisal that have been done for this period. And we hope that by 2016, uh, to achieve uh, our net zero, we should be having that amount of money in the system. So. Our position is that, yes, we continue to engage our private um, partners, we continue to engage our development partners, and we continue to put together uh, the enabling environment to attract uh, private sector uh, players into the space. Just about a month or three weeks ago, uh, my Minister of State, Mr. Herbert Kappa, commissioned the largest solar uh, project, uh, probably in the West African sub-region, uh, in Tema, which was a fully private uh, sector-led uh, initiative. Of course, the government assisted by creating the good, good environment uh, for them to participate. So uh, I want to assure my the, the questioner that yes, um, Ghana will continue, government will continue to uh, create that enabling environment to attract this kind of investment into that space. Thank you very much for your response, um, Honorable Aduma Kumensa. Um, the second question, um, which is more of a comment, but it'd be interesting to hear your perspectives on it, um, says that Ghana is committed to transitioning to a sustainable energy future. The government has implemented numerous policies and strategies to promote renewable energy, enhance energy efficiency, and reduce carbon emissions. Despite these efforts, public understanding and engagement remain limited. There is a need for clear accurate and widely disseminated information to support the national energy transition agenda. Your comments, sir. Well, that, 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 is, a, um, that is true. Uh, personally, I mean, uh, even before I became a deputy minister, there was very little I knew about nuclear. I mean, anything I hear about nuclear is about um, Hiroshima and uh, all the security things that comes with it. So I, I, I began to read about it. Now, what the government have done was that we put together what we call the energy national energy policy. And before this document was put together, uh, there was a roadshow. Uh, government engaged a lot of 
uh, Ghanaians, ordinary Ghanaians, industry players, um, uh, all over Ghana. There was a roadshow throughout the country just to find team a document that would be acceptable or that would reflect the Ghanaian culture and the Ghanaian perspective. And so that document is available. Uh, we also have the framework which is available for people to read uh, and get more information about this whole transition period. Just last year, we had an engagement with the Nuclear Energy Agency, which is headquarters in Paris. They were in Ghana to engage our secondary schools. And it is important that when you talk about even nuclear, sometimes it takes 20, 30, 40 years to even get it in place. And so our friends and sisters and brothers who are in secondary school now really will be the beneficiaries of this transition and, and, and nuclear project that government intends to do now. So it's important that we engage them now for them to understand the importance of um, energy transition. And so I agree with the, uh, the questioner, um, government will continue to um, engage just as we are doing here to put, push more information. I think it's important if we use our secondary school system for our brothers and sisters, younger ones, to have a better understanding of this whole concept of energy transition, even before they leave school, so it doesn't become something new to them. So I agree perfectly with you, and I can assure you that we'll continue to engage and promote uh, the issue of energy transition. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to touch on just um, one more question. I know um, you're almost out of time to, to head back into your sessions. Um, but um, as you're a member of parliament, um, I'd like to you know, address this question to you, which says that what legislative measures are currently being discussed in parliament to support Ghana's energy transition and how can they be expedited? So currently there's a lot of realignment that is going on within the energy sector. Government is trying to, um, you know, we have NETCO, which is the northern um, aspect of electricity. We have ECG. Government, through um, SCSOs, been engaging for some time. Now there's a bill in Parliament now trying to realign the activities of these two companies and make it one. We're also trying to see how whether PURC, which is the Public Utility Regulation Authority, who also met with the Energy Commission so that we don't have a situation where the uh, efforts will be duplicated. Um, I know this energy transition framework and plan that was put together, we engage very strongly parliament in this whole process. The committee on energy was fully, fully involved. Uh, we got some assistance from the legislation uh, committee, a subsidiary legislation committee of parliament that also got itself involved. Indeed, recently, parliament has set up uh, a committee uh, which is focused mainly on energy transition. Uh, in fact, when you come to parliament, there are um, groups that are formed uh, within parliament, friends, friendship groups. Currently, there's a group that is focused entirely on environment. It has come to stay. Uh, Ghana's um, changes in even our rain patterns is very clear to everybody that the energy or um, climate change is, is a big, big issue that we all have to uh, come together to, to assess. So yes, Parliament is really, really involved. We are yet to pass this realignment, but I can confidently tell you that it has left uh, the ministries of energy uh, to Parliament and the subsidiary legislation is looking at it. Looking at the time in Parliament now, we are returning on Tuesday, just for a day or two, certain, and come back probably in November. I'm not too sure we'll be able to go through all the processes within the lifespan of this of this uh, uh, of this parliament. But of course, once that's it is in parliament, I, I'm sure that it will be in our books, and we can quickly look at it when we resume uh, probably next year. Thank you very much, um, Honourable Aduma Kumensa. Uh, we're very pleased that we could have um, some of your time today um, with a very busy uh, schedule that you have. Uh, so we're very grateful. Uh, there was a final question about what Ghana's uh, react nuclear reactor status is from Russia, but um, 
I, I if you want to comment on that, fine. If not, um, we'll, we'll say thank you very much for your time. And um, I, I'd oh, like the, to the, say, the, the, um, <laughs> please go the ahead. Nuclear reactor status with Russia. Uh, uh, it, it, I mean, it's from Nkrumah's days, I mean, it started um, time ago. And unfortunately, we've not been able to move ahead with that. I mean, successive governments, not just this government, successive governments have not been able to uh, move ahead. It, it, a lot of political reasons which I'm sure is not appropriate for this particular forum. Uh, but what I can say now is that uh, as we sit here now, as I, as I speak to you, uh, we've made some significant progress. And it's likely that we are going to sign some agreement next week with the Chinese who are going to help us put the structure in place under the OOT arrangement. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, we're very grateful for your time. And um, it was a pleasure having you um, as part of our webinar today. We wish you all the best in the rest of your deliberations um, in Nairobi. And I'm sure I can say on behalf of the partners and staff of Deloitte, that next time you come knocking on our doors, we definitely will give you a very warm reception. So thank you, sir. And um, have a good rest <laughs> of your day. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to have joined. And, um... yeah. I, I'm sure the, the, the other panelists will do justice to the, to the issues. Yes, I'm sure thank they you. are. So at this point, um, thank you all for um, your patience and allowing us to um, change gears or change course slightly here. We'll go back um, to Eko Kofi's presentation, uh, which we will finish up, and then we'll go into the panel discussion. So Eko, please pick up from where you left off. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eunice. And, and that was a very exciting discussion with the Honorable Deputy Minister. So, yes, basically, I think um, yet again in the response that um, the other the brief discussion we have with the Honorable Deputy, he also talked about the financing framework. And we've seen an example with um, a recent um, private investor, LMI, who's done the largest rooftop. Um, there also other sources, PPP and domestic financing were also identified in the framework as other sources of financing um, this energy or ambitious energy transition goal. So um, the framework, provide some policy recommendations in some key sectors, right? So you've, um, it, it highlights one decarbonization and then one interesting thing, and this certainly creates opportunities for private investors who want to um, um, reduce their or net out their emissions. GAG's um, emitting industries, that's greenhouse gas emitting it shall be required to establish three plantations to offset emissions. And um, um, Forestry Commission is and, and EPA are doing a great job laying the framework on that. So whoever is interested in can have a chat and 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 move ahead on that. Uh, promote and encourage the use of EVs. Uh, Energy Commission has done a great job on that. Currently, they are working on the regulations for the charging stations and uh, promote the use of hydrogen fuel. And um, we are aware there is. A private investor currently doing um, environmental assessment to set up a hydrogen plant. So another area it highlights um, or makes some policies: energy access and security, expedite oil and gas exploration to fund development of clean energy technologies. Um, I'm not sure we've seen it too much, but hopefully we have Dr. Sheila on the on the on the panelist session to give us some highlights on that. Expand gas infrastructure to ensure reliable and adequate supply of gas for power and non-power uses. And then another area to you have the policy direction given is encourage the use of clean coal stoves. Interestingly, if you look at our NDCs, um, clean coal stoves take about 40% 40, 40 of our um, 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 emission reduction goal. So there's also great opportunities there. And then basically cross cut and um, establish an energy transition fund. Um, it will be helpful to, to know where we are on that. 
Um, it's unfortunate we have the honorable deputy minister drop off the call, but may hopefully the, the panelists can give us some guidance on that and then encourage regional cooperation among African countries. So this one thing we saw, we've also seen Herrera commencing work on harmonization of framework and regulations to enhance cooperation. And then also mainstream gender and implementation of energy transition. Uh, the ECOWAS actually set up um, an, an energy uh, a framework to promote gender um, as part of achieving um, energy access within its member states. So um, the Honorable Deputy I did talk about it that there was a transition from the framework to the investment plan. And basically there was a need for um, a transition and investment plan primarily to attract investments, right? And while at the same time ensuring a just energy transition and fully supporting Ghana's rapid economic growth. Um, so these are the highlights of the framework, right? Um, what it basically says that in, in focusing on the alternative net zero pathways, these five interrelated objectives will be the guiding principles. Environmental sustainability, energy system cost, economic impact, social implications, and security of supply. I think when we switch to the Honorable Deputy Ministers, somebody posed the question on the impact on, on the vulnerable lives um, as we pursue this um, energy transition goal. And then four main decarbonization technologies were also highlighted um, in the transition as renewables, low carbon hydrogen, battery electric vehicles, and clean cook stoves cover over 90% of the 2060 abatement. And then we see yet again, the amount of money that is required, 550 billion in capital investment. And um, the point six is a very interesting, it's a capital market could provide largest funding pool, but tapping these sources will require de-risking interventions. Basically, we need enhanced regulatory framework to safeguard the investments um, from, from these um, sources. So what are the limitations? I mean, we need to, we need to be, discuss it so that as we target these um, or achieving our energy transition goal, we make sure that any loose ends are tied along the way. So one, there are concerns that the targets set are overly ambitious, given the current state of infrastructure and investment in many regions. Um, I think that, 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 that probably is pretty obvious for the most of us. Concern about the capacity of existing institutions to implement the framework effectively. I think the Honorable Deputy Mr. Dis mentioned that there's a plan to merge PRC and East um, Energy Commission. Um, whether that was the thinking, um, um, hopefully we'll find out in due course. Regulatory uncertainties, there's still gap there, right? Transition to cleaner energy sources is often associated with significant upfront cost, likely to result in increased national debt or diversion of funds from critical sectors such as health. Right, it's also a major concern. And um, so, and I think in 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 structuring this, that is why the NDC says that countries should determine their own own targets. And the idea is that you look at what your challenges are, and then based on that, you you establish that framework so that you 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 don't stifle on other sectors whilst meeting your energy transition goals. Um, the energy transition framework does not provide sufficient detail on how to manage the transition and support workers affected by these changes. Hopefully, we'll hear some more from the panelists' discussion on how this is being tackled. Large-scale energy projects, projects, especially those involving land acquisition for renewable energy infrastructure, co-displace local communities and exacerbate social inequalities. I think this is a concern to many concerned that the framework might prioritize energy transitions that could lead to higher energy costs, potentially making energy less affordable for low-income households. We, it will be interesting to also know how this concern is being tackled. May overlook other environmental impacts such as biodiversity loss due to large scale. There have been concerns, um, I think the recent um, float, um, um, hype, um, hydro um, floating hydro project that the 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 life the aquatic life below um the panels 
um, will be, um, or there's a likely impact on that. I think in one of the documentaries I, I watched that they are yet to commission a study to to assess the impact um, um, of that. So that's also some concerns as we as we um, prioritize large scale deployment of renewable energy infrastructure. Rapid shift towards renewable energy might compromise energy security, particularly if the transition leads to increased dependency on imported technologies or materials such as rare edge. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, the framework focuses too much on mitigation, reducing emissions and the expense of adaptation. It would be good to also know whether these concerns are, are real or whether these are being addressed. So what is really the goal? The goal of this webinar is to discuss how to accelerate Ghana's energy transition goals with support from the private sector, improved re regulatory framework and global interrelationships amidst the concerns on the limitations and risk of the national energy transition framework and the national energy transition and investment plan. Thank you. So uh, that is now I will hand over to Eunice. Thank you. Thank you, Echo, um, for the very detailed um, and informative presentation. There's a lot of uh, information in there. And I think as um, the deputy minister mentioned um, during his responses to the questions. Uh, there's information that's available, publicly available for um, anyone who has an interest in, in what is going on with this whole energy transition um, activity to read up on it and to, um, and to inform themselves as well as also uh, hopefully join in the advocacy for us working towards a more sustainable energy future for ourselves and for the generations to come. So at this point, uh, we're going to switch to our panel discussion. Um, and to do that, we're going to be introducing our panelists. And here to help me do that is um, Mavis Enima J, um, who is an energy expert also from the energy consulting team here at Deloitte. And uh, Mavis will be introducing our panelists for us. So Mavis, thank you. Hi, thank you, Eunice. Okay, so as Eunice Riley mentioned, uh, we have our panelists who are ready uh, for us to kickstart our Q and A sessions. So we begin. I begin with uh, Bradley. Hoku Amangwa. So Bradley is the principal coordinator for Ghana's Energy Transitioning Office. He is known for his work in energy transitioning and climate and sustainability initiatives. Hoku Amangwa has been recognized as a rising star individual in the energy sector, which showcases his growing influence and contributions to the field. His ambition is to lead the next generation of African entrepreneurs to lift the continent out of poverty. Additionally, he is furthering his expertise by studying for a Master of Science in Energy Systems at the University of Oxford. His academic pursuits align with his professional commitment to climate and sustainability, positioning him as an expert in both the theoretical and practical aspects of energy systems. Our next panelist is Dr. Sheila Addo. So Dr. Sheila Addo holds the position of the Director for Policy Hello. Go ahead, Mavis. I think we can hear you now. Okay, so I'll continue. I think there was an internet glitch. Sorry. Yeah, so Dr. Sheila Addo holds the position of Director for Policy Coordination at the National Petroleum Authority. She is an energy policy strategist her interests and focus have been on energy and environmental policy formulation and implementation, as well as management of the commercial, social, and regulatory 
impacts of such policy. She has undertaken pivotal roles within the NPA, accumulating over a decade of influential positions. Okay, it seems uh, Mavis is um, having some uh, internet challenges again. Um, and so I think we'll just go ahead um, and start the panel discussion. Um, first of all, I would like to um, address uh, Mr. Brady Pokwa Mankwa, uh, who um, I happen to know was played uh, a very instrumental part um, in the development of the um, energy transition um, investment plan, um, which um, I'll have him share a few remarks about the role that um, that he and his organization, uh, Sustainable Energy for All or SE for All, uh, played in, in that um, endeavor before I um, go into some of the specific questions. So Bradley, please permit me to um, have you just give us a few opening remarks uh, before we get into the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eunice. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, I'm glad to be joining you and the audience today. Um, so as you said, I'll talk a bit about what um, SE for All's role in the energy transition agenda for Ghana has been. Um, I know some of the audience will notice that we've been mentioning energy transition framework, and then we've also mentioned the energy transition investment plan. These are two different documents, yes. Um, I happen to have worked on both of them, actually. So before my current role, I was um, working at the Ministry of Energy here in Ghana as a, as a technical assistant to the minister. And um, I was the secretary to the committee that put up the framework. Now, this framework was launched. Um, this was the one. This is the one with the 2070 um, net neutrality date. This was launched at Sharm El Sheikh for COP27, I believe. And at the time, SE for All actually supported in, in collaboration with Bloomberg Philanthropies to give the platform for this to be launched. And then a year later, as um, Honorable Collins, Adam Akumens has said, the Energy Transition Investment Plan, which was also done in collaboration with SE for All, um, was launched on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. And pretty much my role here is to implement this plan, this investment plan, to see how we can get some actionable projects out of that um, here in Ghana, which we, we, we are currently doing. So yeah, that's in a nutshell what we are what we are up to here in Accra. Thank you very much, um, Bradley. So I'll, I'll go ahead um, with my first question for you. Um, which is in the area of entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so Bradley, um, from your viewpoint, you know, from where you sit and, um, you know, what you know of, of this energy transition, um, how do you see the role of entrepreneurship um, in driving Ghana's energy transition? And are there some specific initiatives um, that you believe can foster innovation in this sector? I just realized I was muted, sorry. So entrepreneurship can play a critical role in driving Ghana's energy transition by fostering uh, a number of innovative solutions, for instance, for job creation and also increasing energy access whilst we're at it. Because entrepreneurs bring fresh perspectives to the sector and they often leverage new technologies such as digital platforms and community-driven models that can accelerate the adoption of renewable energy. Um, they can also develop some interesting off-grid applications, such as mini grids and energy efficient appliances that cater to rural and undeserved populations. Um, if we go into specific initiatives, we can look at stuff like energy innovation hubs, um, which are dedicated hubs focusing on, in, in this case, they could focus on renewable energy startups, providing resources, mentorship, and networking opportunities to help them scale. So. Here in Accra, we have something called um, Impact Hub, for instance. That's not specifically 
targets at, at energy um, startups, but we could have one specifically for energy. We also have the Ghana Climate Innovation Center, GCIC, which is fantastic, which is also you know, incubating a number of startups in that space, in the, in the climate tech space. So those are, those, those are some examples of what you can do. Um, on on community-based initiatives, you could encourage the formation of community-based renewable energy cooperatives, for instance, to empower local communities and ensure equitable access to clean energy. Now, in my travels in Bangladesh, for instance, I noticed that this was quite a popular approach. Um, so they had a lot of smaller players um, participating in different aspects of the chain, um, not necessarily developing large technologies or whatever, but they're, they're applying what they call Jugad innovation technologies. So for instance, making certain applications from cheaper materials, et cetera, you know, at that, at that level, which was pretty interesting. And then also technology transfer and partnerships. So fostering partnerships with international organizations, mm -hmm. research institutions, universities, and technology providers to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and technology, promoting research and development in renewable energy technologies can lead to homegrown innovations in Ghana's energy sector. And I think another aspect that I'll touch on is gender equality. Um, basically promoting gender equality in the energy sector by ensuring that women have equal opportunities to participate in entrepreneurship, leadership and decision-making roles. Because entrepreneurship is more of a democratic space, should I say, um, it also allows for that kind of greater access for gender equity and participation in the energy sector. Thank you very much uh, for um, those the responses and and um, a lot of um, you know juicy nuggets here that you mentioned on how entrepreneurship. Uh, can help to drive the energy transition. Um, I am hopeful that our, our audience are paying close attention and looking at, uh, for the entrepreneurs um, within the, the group, looking at different ways or things that hopefully uh, we can also do um, as a private sector to participate um, in this, this whole energy transition um, endeavor. Um, I'll now switch to um, Dr. Sheila Addo, um, who is our other panelist. Um, the Honorable Deputy Minister was supposed to be the third, but because of his schedule, um, he's had to um, uh, step away. Um, but Sheila, um, I know you also have been involved in the energy transition um, activity uh, right from the beginning. Um, we just heard Bradley talk about, um, you know, gender as an aspect of, of this. Um, you also happen to work in the oil and gas space, um, generally. Um, I'd like to hear your, um, I'd like to hear your perspectives. Um, haven't seen, you know, this whole process from the beginning up until now, um, what would you say um, is Ghana's progress so far? I mean, would you, would, in your, in your, uh, from your perspective, uh, are we doing quite well? We know we have the target. There's quite a bit to be done. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot that it's going to take to get there. Uh, but I, I just would like you to share a little bit about the journey as you see it. And um, I just wanted to be mindful. I didn't address this question to you because you're a woman, but because <laughs> I know, I know we've been working on on ways in which women can get more involved um, right. in the energy sector and and in leadership and some of these uh, these um, these and and you know initiatives. So um, could you maybe just touch a little bit on that, and then um, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective coming from the oil and gas. Um, side of things. Okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eunice. Um, so really, so I'll speak specifically to the gender issue as related to our energy transition targets. Um, one peculiar thing, I wouldn't say it's peculiar, one key thing that Ghana did or Ghana focused on when we started working on our energy transition framework is to also accept the fact that we're not necessarily in a hurry to transition to renewable energy whilst having our hydrocarbons trapped 
Okay, and so we we decided to put in certain targets, like making sure that we accelerate the production of our hydrocarbons and then the usage of our hydrocarbons so that we don't have stranded assets. Um, we've found a way to incorporate gender within this conversation because when you're looking at having a just energy transition, you want to make sure socioeconomics are good, everybody has equal access and all of that. Um, I'm aware that within the national energy policy framework, there are certain gender targets for upstream petroleum, for downstream petroleum. There are certain programs that, that you know, are implemented across the oil and gas space to make sure that as part of encouraging Ghanaian content and Ghanaian participation, gender equality is as much as possible um, allowed. So for example, in the upstream business, um, for, for support services, for the provision of support services in the upstream business, there is a lot of um, emphasis by the upstream regulator, which is the Petroleum Commission, to try and encourage some sort of gender parity. And unfortunately for us, when we're talking about gender parity in Ghana, we're looking at how we push women. Um, it's not necessarily to overflow the issue about having women participate, but because that, unfortunately, the scale is tilted less towards um, women participation than male participation in the sector. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of STEM education um, to encourage the females to get involved in science, um, technology, engineering, and mathematics education so they can get into some oil and gas jobs. Um, I know our focus is also not to have the women in the support services when they are in the job. So, it's very typical for you to get into an oil and gas organization and you're seeing the secretary as a woman. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but there are fewer executives. There are fewer female executives and there are fewer females in technical roles. And there's a lot going on. Um, in the energy transition, in the national energy policy, there are targets to as much as possible hire women into technical roles, as much as possible hire women into executive roles. I mean, as especially when they qualify for such roles, there are support systems given to other non-governmental organizations like um, Women Leadership in Energy, one organization that UNES, you and I belong to, um, to sort of push. Um, um, NGOs or non-governmental organizations to also support the, the agenda to encourage women in energy. So there's a lot going on, but there's still a lot more to be done. Um, financing for women in energy is needed. Financing for women businesses in energy is needed. Um, capacity for women businesses in energy is also needed. Um, some sort of work-life balance, education, and grooming for, for up-and-coming ladies in the sector is also needed. But so far, um, um, Eunice, we do have some targets set in the, in the energy um, plan or the national energy policy, which has been implemented significantly. I would say that from the sector that I come from, the subsector I come from, which is the petroleum downstream, it, there's quite a lot of female participation in there, and we're still encouraging female participation as much as possible. Thanks, Eunice. Thank you very Thank much, you very much for, for those perspectives. Um, okay, so um, specific to the framework and huh. uh, transition to the to the framework, from a regulatory uh, standpoint, uh, I'm sorry, from a policy standpoint rather, huh. uh, what are the key policy changes that you see are needed to support Ghana's transition? Uh, to renewable energy and how can these be effectively implemented? Okay, thank you again, Eunice. Um, like I mentioned earlier on, the focus is not necessarily go with the global targets of energy transition um, because we think that Ghana, like every other African country, should have the opportunity to, like I said earlier, maximize their hydrocarbon resources. After all, the whole continent contributes just about 3% to total global emissions. Um, just three continents do 90%. So America, Asia, Europe do 90%. And you've had, you've had um, developed countries producing hydrocarbon well over 200 years and developing their economies as much as possible. And you're telling countries like Ghana or countries within Sub-Saharan Africa that has a high energy poverty to suspend hydrocarbon productions by the year 2030 
it is not a possibility and it would hurt our economies. And I'm glad that um, the group of African energy ministers sort of have gone with this position. And that has fed into the Ghana Energy Transition Plan. That is why we are taking our time to transition completely by the year 2070. And one of the things we've been saying is that we're looking at net zero targets. And net zero means that you can emit and have your mitigation measures combined together to give you net zero targets. So if you're emitting hydrocarbons and you have mitigation measures to clean up, you should be able to also still produce. Okay, so um, I wouldn't say, when you look at the policy framework we put together, I wouldn't say that there are necessarily changes that need to be made. Um, a lot of these things I'm mentioning, we considered whilst putting together the policy framework. It's about implementation. So you definitely must have some clear goals and targets with commitments. And if you look at the body of the Ghana Energy Transition Framework, that is what we did. There were clear targets year on year basis up until the year 2060 and not until the year 2070. So you would notice that as some during certain phases, you would see that gas drives the transition. And then during certain phases, you see that nuclear energy also drives the transition. And we considered both electricity and petroleum. And that 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 is a key thing you must consider. Um, when putting together an energy transition framework. First, the fact that you are looking to pace your transition to make sure it is just. And sustainability for our side of the world is not the same as sustainability for, for the Europeans or for the Americans, okay? Number two, we did establish some renewable energy targets and portfolios. So Deputy Minister mentioned that we did have some 10% um, renewable energy targets by, by a certain year. It is key to have that kind of clarity in your policy and that's, that, that's what was done. Number three is you must look at the regulatory framework. So whilst having the overall target for the country who is supposed to champion what okay in in the energy sector in ghana the regulator for electricity is the energy commission that's a technical regulator and then the economic regulator is a purc okay um regulator for petroleum upstream is a petroleum commission regulator for the downstream is a national petroleum authorities all of these all of these entities are supposed to come together to look at what the regulatory framework would look like what the licensing and permitting process should look like, what the standards, operational standards should look like, tariffs and pricing and all of that. Number four, we have to look at making sure that there's an efficient, energy efficiency targets and plans. Okay, and all of that was also incorporated. Um, have your research and development, have your monitoring and evaluation to see how we're progressing um, since we started putting in place this policy and up until the year 2070. Most importantly um, is to also ensure that you have a just energy transition. Um, when you're talking about having a just energy transition, you have to make sure that there are no job losses. Um, you're focusing on fixing energy poverty first as against um, introducing renewable energy. And Ghana has had a good balance. We've introduced a lot of renewable energy, solar, um, we're already producing hydroelectric power. In the petroleum sector, we're looking at introducing biofuels. Um, there's electric vehicles all over the place. Um, all, all of that has to be considered. Um, for the petroleum downstream, if you want to talk about making sure there's just transition, you have to make sure you're not having stranding of the petroleum downstream assets, okay? So there's storage facility, there is um, refineries, there are, what do you do with those, 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 that's, that infrastructure whilst you say you're completely switching to renewable energy, okay? So we have to make sure there are plans. Then you must make sure that Ghanaian content and Ghanaian participation is very critical. Note that in Ghana, we have stopped saying local content because there's a difference between local content and Ghanaian content. So if you're making sure your transition is just, you're making sure that private sector is truly Ghanaian or business participation is truly Ghanaian and you're giving opportunities for Ghanaians to, to truly transition. There's a lot, but I'll pause here because I might take all your time, but that's it. Focus on making sure there's a just transition that benefits the people and we're not in a rush to hit 2030 targets. We're slowing down so we can make sure that we're transitioning um, hydrocarbon assets and making sure we're maximizing our hydrocarbon assets. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ado. Uh, very, very insightful.
insightful and, and interesting conversation. I'm sure we could uh, continue talking <laughs> about that um, um, for, for quite some time. So I'd like to switch back uh, to Bradley now. Um, and Bradley, I'd like to um, touch on a question in the in the area of um, the youth. I'll, I'll go on to youth engagement and how can young entrepreneurs, um, in your view, how can they be encouraged to participate um, in the energy sector and what support uh, mechanisms are necessary in order to um, facilitate their involvement, uh, particularly in the energy transition. Thanks, Eunice. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but I, I think you can hear me at this point. We, we can see and hear you. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, in terms of youth participation, I mean, there are a number of entry barriers. I'm, I'm, I'm a young person myself, and I can speak to them quite directly. And if you have the, the right environment, like an enabling environment, I mean, it just makes everything easier, right? So for instance, I'll give you an example. When I used to work at the ministry, um, I was one of the youngest people on the senior team. And what it took to get me involved or get me active in some of these projects was literally vouching from the top. So if you're a leader in the energy space, if you're a leader in whichever sector, if you wanna have more young people participating, you're going to have to actively bring them in, right? So we call that, in some cases, it's called mentorship. It's called sponsorship, literally, where you go beyond mentoring to actively, you know, maybe like having quotas, for instance, making sure that there's a number of young people at a certain age in different projects or even on your boards, et cetera. And that's something that my former boss, the former minister for energy, was pretty big on. So if, if, you, if you know anything about what he was up to, um, we had kind of some young people on every kind of project that we're doing, which was fantastic for people like me. And that gave me a good head start in my career in the energy sector. Um, other things that you could do as well to boost young people's confidence is training programs and capacity building. So, you know, providing technical training, mentorship and skills development focused on renewable energy and energy efficient technologies, business management and project development, et cetera. Also, a number of young entrepreneurs will complain about things like access to finance and grants on their journeys to creating um, energy startups. So you could also create funding mechanisms such as seed grants, microloans, or impact investment funds specifically designed for young entrepreneurs in the energy sector. Um, for instance, this is a bit different to that, but I know the Energy Commission does the um, high school challenge every year, which is amazing. Um, and it's, it's a fantastic initiative. You have different schools competing to develop technologies, also using Jugadian for um, innovation most of the time that can actually become applicable in the space. And it's it's it's, it's amazing to, to see. I, I go and watch from time to time whenever I have the chance. And also regulatory simplification. So making the barriers entry lower again by making regulatory requirements lower and transparent, right? So for instance, if there are some entrepreneurs who have an application for solar, for instance, for solar street lights. Um, we might be able to have a team from KNUST developing something, but are they going to win the same bid? Are they going to be able to win the same bid that any other company here that has been established for 30 years you know, will, 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 will do? I don't know. And that's a lot to do with also how the regulatory environment is set up for people, for, for nicer companies. I mean, newer companies, sorry. Um, awareness campaigns are also important. Um, so promoting the importance of clean energy and entrepreneurship through awareness campaigns, workshops and events, highlighting the success of young entrepreneurs in the sector and integrating renewable energy concepts into school curricula, like I said, can also be good for um, awareness creation. And I'll just segue a little bit because actually, so myself and Dr. Ado used to be on the um, Energy Transition Committee together. And so she can even speak to some of, you know, uh, you, you will basically see me, I'll be the youngest person on the team all the time. It's very noticeable, but, you know, everybody being open and welcoming to younger people as well really helps boost your confidence. And I had that kind of support from my senior colleagues and my, my colleagues on the committee. So I think that also helps. And my final notes would probably be um, 
innovation challenges. I've touched on it in a certain way by speaking about the um, renewable energy challenge that we do, but um, organizing more of those kind of innovation challenges or hackathons, specifically targeting young people and encouraging them to develop creative and sustainable energy solutions might also be helpful. Thank you very much, Bradley. Um, I hope uh, the younger ones in the, in the audience uh, have listened closely to what you said and hopefully have, have picked a few things that they could you know, take a look at uh, because uh, the, the energy transition is here, whether we like it or not, um, as the minister said, um, and I think Echo touched on as well, we're seeing the impacts of it and um, we, we definitely, we don't have a choice. It's, it's something that we have to do. So all, all hands on board there. Okay. So Dr. Addo, I'll switch back uh, to you now. Okay. Um, on stakeholder engagement. <laughs> How important um, do you see that stakeholder engagement is in the development of the the energy policies and then what what approaches do you recommend uh, for ensuring that um, diverse voices are heard? In, in Great. Okay. Thank you, Yunus. So um, pretty much your stakeholders are the, are, the, are the group that would either drive the policy um, to success or drive it to to uh, to be unsuccessful kind of and you would have a broad range of stakeholders right from the people that your regulatory policy directly affects that's the businesses um who have invested their money in 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 the sector right from CSOs or civil society organizations who sort of are the voices of the consumers in, in my in my um, subsector they are the, they sort of are the voices of consumers at the point when we're discussing policy and then you have your ministries departments and agencies who would also either give you regulatory support or you would require some clarity with so that you don't have some sort of tough um, confusion and it is key to engage them so Typically, what you would want to do is at the point of developing the policy, you could include them at the beginning or you could include them, you know, at the end of the policy. But you, they must in, be included at some point in time. Some strategy you could have, or which is some of the things we do here at MPA, is to include them in working groups. Um, so you're developing a biofuel um, framework, regulatory framework, for example. You should have work groups that would include these stakeholders. And you get to hear their position during the work, uh, during the process of developing the framework. Um, even during the process of developing the framework, if you don't have them as part of the working committees, you could invite them to submit position papers at the beginning of the process. Now, when you're done with the draft I mean, policy process, you, you still must engage them. You must present it to, to, to um, industry participants, civil society, everybody, just to get their final inputs and, and buying into the policy. The third stage is during implementation as well. You should be open to receive feedback from them. Um, it is important because, like I mentioned, the, the, the service provider who you're regulating is the one investing their money into the business. And, I mean, as a regulator, you, you've done your research, you've done your analysis, you've done your conversations, especially with peer organizations, to put up some, some policy or some mm -hmm. guideline. But you must hear from um, the people it impacts directly, especially when it has an economic impact on them. So that's how it becomes successful because if they feel they're not part of the process um, from the beginning through to the end, they're likely to kick out your process. They're likely to look for sensitive times to make it look like your policy won't work. Okay, so that is very key. And, and to identify the stakeholders, include them in the policy process from the beginning, constant engagement during implementation, and constant review also with these um, stakeholders units. Thanks. Thank you very much um, for that response, uh, Dr. Addo. Um, and if you don't mind, um, I'm going to ask you a follow on question. Um, sure you know, to that um, in there, which has to do with public awareness. Okay, uh -huh. you know, we've spoken about the energy transition and so on, at least within the energy circles, you know, we're quite familiar with it. Um, but what role do you believe that public awareness and education um, plays or would play in the success of the energy transition initiatives? And how do you think we've done so far with that? And how do you think that our efforts can be enhanced? 
Okay. So it is very key, no doubt. Um, but like I mentioned, you need to break it down per subsector. So the whole of the Ghana Energy Transition Plan, even during the process of putting it together, there was a lot of regional stakeholder engagement. There was, a, I mean, through that process, there was some sort of public awareness done within the districts, within within some of the assemblies and all of that. But you, you have to distill the plan into action, right? And that becomes the responsibility of the regulatory authority. So for, for power, for example, Energy Commission, would do their bit for petroleum. Petroleum Commission and MPA would do their bit. Um, Energy Commission is doing it through the schools, um, the schools competition programs that they are running and all of that. I mean, a lot of adverts and stuff like that. At the MPA, for example, um, one of the key things that um, sort of within is within our remits in the energy transition framework is to use gas as a transition fuel right remember i mentioned we want to maximize our hydrocarbons as much as possible and we're, we're creating awareness about switching cooking fuels from wood fuels to gas to lpg because over 60 percent of households in ghana still use cooking fuels that are not clean that are you know um that, that are destructive to their health and their life. So once you identify these targets, you do a lot of nationwide sensitization. So you run sensitization campaigns in these bits and pieces of the National Energy Transition Plan, because you can't run an advert on a whole on the whole National Energy Transition Plan. People would not relate. So you pick bits and pieces depending on what product you're trying to run. So we're running a natural gas, a, a compressed natural gas for transportation campaign, even though it's a hydrocarbon, is, a, is one of the cleanest form of hydrocarbons. We're running that campaign and that is part of our plan to transition, okay? We're running an LPG campaign as, an, as a clean cooking fuel. That is also part of our plan to transition. You would run public adverts, you would run engagements with your stakeholders, you would you would run community engagements, door-to-door -door engagement, and it's very key. Because without that, you don't get the consuming public to understand what you want to do and also to participate because there's business opportunities. There's also the health benefits of switching. So you, you trumpet these benefits and then do some, you run some campaigns and that's what we've done so far to be successful with some of the projects that we're running. Thank you very much, um, Sheila, um, Dr. Addo. You've you've really broken down the the energy transition into into uh -huh. specific actions and steps that people can relate to. Um, you know, everybody understands. You know, the the drive and push towards clean cooking and uh, um, using natural gas for for fuel versus others. So, thank you for for breaking things down um, for us all, so we know exactly how in a very practical way, energy transition is being promoted. Um, my next question is for Bradley. And um, Bradley, I'd like to talk about the interconnectedness of sectors. I know, you know, both of you um, are from the energy sector, yes. Um, but I, I also know that um, as part of the whole energy transition, there are some other sectors that are involved as well. So how do you see the interrelationship between energy transition and other sectors, such as transportation and agriculture, um, impacting the overall sustainability um, efforts um, that are underway under this whole, you know, energy transition framework? Thanks again, Eunice. Um, so I'll piggyback off what Dr. Addo was speaking about, which is stakeholder engagement and use that as an example, right? So when we were doing the stakeholder engagement for the energy transition framework, we spoke to probably every possible um, professional body, right? So from the clergy to students, to journalists, to traditional leaders, et cetera. And what we're basically doing was that, or what, what this was basically acknowledging was the fact that you can't have good policy if it's not also kind of from the bottom up, right? So the person that is supposed to be impacted by this policy should kind of have a say in how the policy is developed or formulated. Now, this kind of cross sectorial dialogue actually helped us to improve that framework in, 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 in that instance, right? So we had some ideas, we had some theories, but we took it out there to the people 
and we said it with them and we, we found a lot more insights actually from them. So things that we wouldn't be able to think about. So for instance, how energy transition would affect certain farmers. You have to speak to somebody in the rural area. I remember when we were in Sishiri also for one of the, the sessions, it was particularly impactful to me because we then hear from farmers, oh, we're having this and this challenge with crop, um, our crop cycles due to the, the way the weather is changing, et cetera. How does energy transition affect us in this instance? So I think that's why it's super important to engage different um, sectors or bring different people to the table to have conversations. Um, if you look at something like public private partnerships, for instance, that's another good example of how, you know, we bring together different sectors to have dialogue on, on certain conversations. Um, I know the energy commission again, not to, they're not, they're not my favorite or anything, but I just know a lot of the examples. Um, they have the eco fridges initiative that they put out some time back, for instance, and that I think brought together people from the private sector and the banking sector. Um, I think one of the UN agencies as well was also involved. And that was basically kind of a, uh, a tool that they came up with to make uh, um, more efficient fridges available to consumers on mass. And it was widely successful. And that's because everybody brought the best of their um, sector expertise to the table to make it happen. Now, in terms of you, you mentioned transport, agriculture, etc. We all sit on the same climate nexus. Um, you know, there's, there's this trilemma about food and fuel and something else, right? So any conversation that we're having about availability of fuel sources ends up being sometimes, especially where renewable energy sources are concerned, ends up having some implications on, on climate as well, on um, agriculture as well. Um, for instance, the issue of biofuel. So it's the challenge between, or the dichotomy between having food sources available for biofuel, like corn, ethanol, et cetera, for biofuel versus having it for food, you know? And so you have to have, once again, have, you know, multi-sector conversations and dialogue to make sure that if we are, if we have these decarbonization agendas and we want to start using alternative fuels, we're not also depleting food sources in the process because that can also have catastrophic events for us. Um, where transportation is concerned, we can't, also avoid them. Um, EVs are proliferating the global market quite aggressively. I know sometimes in Ghana, when you start talking about EVs, people get a bit testy and a, a bit uncomfortable because they say, you know, we haven't finished solving our electricity challenges and so why are we looking there? But it's not a choice, right? Most cars in Ghana, over 90% of vehicles in Ghana are imported from other countries. Now, if you look at the the, the countries that are producing these cars, a lot of them have targets that by 2030, they're going to decarbonize their fleets. So the cars that we are buying, both first-hand and second-hand, are going to increasingly becoming um, as EVs. Now, what do we do? We can sit there and say we're not ready for the electric revolution in cars, or we can actually recognize this for what it is, and it's, it's not a choice, right, and start preparing in advance. It's going to affect us in so many ways. Um, for instance, spare parts, we are, you know, if you go to Swami Magazine or Abu Siyokai, these are huge economies, right, that people are bringing in these spare parts from different countries and selling them on to uh, people who already own cars here. So those are also going to be changing. If we are no longer using ICE vehicles, the spare parts are also going to be changing. They don't have, they're going to have typical engines anymore, right? So we're now looking at batteries and other components. And so we need to also start retraining um, the, the labor market here to prepare for that as opposed to being afraid of this so-called revolution. And that's why, again, sectoral, intersectoral dialogue is so important in this energy transition agenda. I don't know if that answers all of your questions. Yes, it, it does. Um, and um, thank you very much. I know I've had uh, both of you talking for some time now. Um, I'll, I'll ask a final question that... Um, I, it would be good probably to get both of your perspectives. Bradley, I was going to address it to you first, but, you know, if Sheila, if you have something you want to add um, after he's responded, we'll do that. And then um, we'll switch gears and um, go into the question and answer uh, session. There's been several questions that have been coming in um, whilst you both have been speaking and I uh, will try and uh, address them. And um, yeah. 
about the next 20 minutes or so and, and then give you a, a chance to rest. You've been talking for a while. So thank you very much. Um, so this final question has to do with metrics. I mean, we spoke about monitoring and evaluation and and you know, making sure that we have all that in place, you know, as we look to um progress um, energy transition here in Ghana. So um, Bradley, to you, what metrics or indicators do you think should be used to measure the success of Ghana's energy transition efforts over the next decade? Hmm, okay. Um, then, I think some you know, of the obvious yeah. things. Yeah, I was just going to say, be... and, and, and Sheila can weigh in on that as well, if she'd like. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think she's, she's definitely is more qualified to speak on that. You know, that's why she's a doctor in her title. But, um, you know, I think some of the more obvious ones would be things like um, emissions rates. So obviously we have targets that we've set. If we're able to meet them or at least get closer to them, then we know that we are, we are, we are moving forward. Um, I think we've also got to look at things like maybe um, fuel mix. So if the ratios are changing, if you are seeing a bit more renewable in the mix, that mm -hmm. also could be an indicator. Could be again because it's not that um, black and white. Because sometimes you can you could have increasing renewables, but it could, <laughs> you might actually be moving further away from net neutrality because of the the composition of the actual um, source. So, but yeah, these are the typical kind of metrics that you would look at. Maybe also investment into clean energy sources. Um, that could also be another direct way of you know realizing. That we are moving closer to decarbonization. Yeah? These are some of the most simple ones, I would say. But um, I think I'll pass over to Doc to take us <laughs> more technical. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bradley. Um, I, I think Bradley mentioned, I, in my opinion, I like to make them some of the direct and indirect metrics that we should look at. Um, Bradley mentioned some of the direct metrics, which is exactly what the target is and what we should be doing um, in terms of measuring our progress towards a target. Our aim is to be net zero by 2070. And so how are we doing in terms of emissions and cleanup um, 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 plans? Some of the basic, most basic, most basic cleanup plans we actually set up, Bradley, if you remember, is tree planting um, to sort of do some, some natural carbon capture for us, um, by the way. But in addition to that, um, which Brian, Bradley is absolutely right, is, is what, because our focus is to have a just transition and, and make sure that we're transitioning such that there are no job losses or, or our economy isn't suffering and all of that. Some of the other metrics you could look at is how are we reducing the energy poverty um, in the country? So I mentioned about 60% of our population or about 60% of homes in, in the country are still not using a clean cooking fuel. Okay, how are we reducing that um, whilst we're transitioning? Well, I do admit, like Bradley said that, we cannot sit aloof and say we're not interested in energy transition because like you rightly said, um, the vehicles we use, the composition of the vehicles we use is gradually changing. And so Ghana can sit up and um, can wake up one day and you don't have internal combustion engines in, in the um, in internal combustion engine vehicles in the country, but electric vehicles. What are we doing? Um, you could measure progress to a just transition by looking at how are we, you know, inward looking in terms of our transition progress. So we're part of an African conversation, we're part of a region-wide region, region -wide conversation in terms of looking for financing, for example. So um, the Africa Petroleum Producers Organization is working together to set up something we call an energy bank. Um, because of energy transition, we're not getting international financing for hydrocarbon projects. Um, our progress towards establishing these internal support mechanisms, I would say will be one of the metrics we should be taking off in terms of having a just energy transition. So what's the progress with Ghana's participation in the energy bank, for example? Um, what is the progress with Ghana's participation with regional collaborations under the AFTA to make sure we're doing inter um, regional trade amongst ourselves in terms of energy um, um, supply. So 
if we're not having money to, to produce our hydrocarbons or to do refinery projects, Dangote Refinery somewhere in Nigeria have we collaborated to make sure we maximize that resource before we completely switch to renewable. All the same while still promoting renewable energy projects. Okay, Another metric to look at is how have we supported the consumers or the citizenry to transition efficiently? Now, if you, if you want to have an efficient supply of fuel, whatever type of fuel it is, whether it's is non-renewable fuel, fossil fuel, or um, renewable fuel, which is non-fossil fuel. The three critical things you should be able to answer for a consumer is how affordable is that fuel to the consumer? So if I'm buying renewable fuel, like biofuel into my vehicle, how affordable is that fuel? How available is that fuel? Availability has to do with um, production of that fuel, importation of that fuel, mm -hmm. and how accessible is that fuel, okay? I mean, accessibility has to do with the infrastructure that you use to transmit from the source of production or the source of import into the person's vehicle or into the homes. So you must tick off these three A's for the consumer. You want people to use solar energy, how affordable is that to the consumer? These are some of the just energy transition metrics that I think we should be looking at. And then is there some sort of equitable access of the benefits and opportunities of this transition. So we're talking a lot about Ghanaian content and Ghanaian participation in the energy sector. We're talking about gender gender equality somehow in the energy sector. How are they benefiting? How are these segments of society benefiting from our transition um, goals and targets? All of these must be looked at. They are not necessarily obvious metrics, but this is what affects the citizens, when you're talking about energy transition, this is what helps you directly um, measure the fact that you're, you're, you're reducing the energy poverty um, prevalence in the country or you're closing in on the energy gap and, 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 and um, its impact on development within the country. So I think we must look at that. Besides looking at the obvious metrics of our emissions targets, which is very, very true. You must look at that. The infrastructure we're putting up, financing and all of that. The non-obvious ones in terms of how it affects the citizenry must also be touched on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that very exhaustive um, response. I mean, really from both of you. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a quiz afterwards and the people, whoever gets the responses there, I think we'll have a, something nice from Deloitte from, for you. But Sheila mentioned the three A's. I think I only got two of them. I'd like to ask about the third one. You said affordability, availability. And what was the third Accessibility. A? Accessibility. Accessibility. Yes. Accessibility of the solutions. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, that's great. Well, at this point, um, we're... We're done um, with the, you know, sort of the official panel session, but we have lots of questions that have come up. Uh, I'm sure I feel like, I'm sure the two of you feel like, you know, you just had a whole host of questions coming to you. Uh, but um, we'd like to give an opportunity for uh, maybe, you know, a few of them to be answered um, and to our participants um, for the sake of time, if we're not able to answer all the questions, and there have been many of them that have come through, we'll try and get you responses after the webinar. And um, like we said, we'll post that along with the webinar material um, at our YouTube site um, that we mentioned at the beginning uh, during our housekeeping session. So I'll give our panelists just two seconds to take a breather, and then um, I'll I'll go ahead and. Um, We'll go ahead and 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 ask uh, the questions. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, okay. sorry, I'm getting a. There's there's several questions um, in the chat here, and I think at this point I'll have um, Mavis. Will you come in and I'm getting some uh, different. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, wow. Okay, so one of the questions that um, came up was, uh, someone was asking, so we have uh, a net zero target for 2070, which is, you know, several odd years away. So now between, between now and 2070, are there interim targets that, um, that have been put in place um, that 
we're going to, you know, try to achieve or milestones, if you want to put it that way, um, ahead of getting to, you know, the ultimate target um, in in 27. <laughs> Um, Eunice, is that addressed to anybody in particular or? Um, no, it, it wasn't. Okay. Sorry. For this section, um, I, I'll, I'll leave it up to the two of you, whoever feels. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. But yes, maybe let me attempt that. Yes, there are interim targets. So there is no blanket target that from, we, we worked on this plan, I think all the way from 2020 or so. Um, um, Bradley, I think we come, we we like you said, we launched it in Shamo Sheikh 2023, right? And so the Ghana, but we started work on this a couple of years behind. 2022, right? Okay, so we 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 we've had a couple of years running to work on this, but there are targets in between. Um, there are 2030 targets, there are 2040, 50, 60, and 70 targets. And if you recall in one in one of my earlier submissions, I mentioned that there are phases towards the transition. Okay. In certain phases, it's the transition is driven by natural gas. In certain phases, trans transition is driven by nuclear energy. So it's it's very comprehensive. It's and very it's a public document that's available. There are targets that are about a decade by decade targets in between, starting from 2030, 40, 50, 60, 70. Um, the ultimate aim is to make sure that all of these um, plans culminate to a net zero emissions goal by the year 2070. Okay. But the document is publicly available. I could just add to that. Thank you. Um, I mean, the nationally determined contributions as well kind of outline towards 2030. Right? So, like Doc it doesn't matter which decade we are looking at, there's always shorter number of deliverables that we're expecting. And if you want to understand the more immediate ones, maybe you should look at it from the perspective of the nationally determined contributions, because that was built around um, from COP21 for 2030. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. Um, I have a, a question here um, from, well, I won't mention names, but um, mm -hmm. the, the question here is, uh, how is Ghana reconciling, let's see, the different targets of net zero? The national energy transition proposes a total of 83 gigawatts of renewable energy in Ghana's energy mix, whereas the National Energy Investment Plan targets a total of 160 gigawatts of renewable energy. To the outside world, this may be confusing to potential investors. Uh, can we have a relook re at these different targets? Doc, do you want to take it first? Or... No, I'll leave that to you, Bradley. <laughs> the plan sits oh. with you now. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, like I was saying at the beginning of the call, um, we launched the energy transition framework before we went to work on the energy transition investment plan. Um, in terms of reconciliation, I don't think it's an issue per se. I understand what you're talking about, but um, they are both independent um, documents. Um, you sometimes hear the policymakers speak about them, you know, one after the other or anything, but they all speak to the same. It, the, the energy transition investment plan was built off energy transition framework. So most of the key metrics in there are built off of the same thing. Just looking at, for instance, you notice that the net zero target date is different. It comes, it comes a decade earlier, which is to 2060. Um, which I think when the work was done, I, I'm not on the technical team, but I, I believe when the work was done, it was noticed that, oh, you could actually actualize these same goals just a decade before. So it's not just saying that they are looking for different things or anything. I think it was just trying to create a slightly more different uh, and then we looked at some of the fuel mix percentages as well. Um, to see for feedback from the international donor network that we work with emphasized uh, on this document as well. So I think that the ethos of each document is kind of the same, but then they are also we're attracting different people 
ATIP was specifically made more to the aspect of things. So that's why we, we looked at it a little bit differently the second time. I don't know if that's Thank you, Bradley. Yes, it, it does. Yeah. So, so thank you uh, for that response. Um, so there's a there's a question here um, about um, th that's asking what policy is being put in place um, to support the extra demand that is posed by the value addition in the extract in the extraction of critical material. Uh, yeah, critical mineral. Sorry, in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not sure that's that's clear or that's related to us. Uh, because what well, because you have to critical minerals, because we're talking about hydrocarbons, um, petroleum and, and all of that in, in, in our sector. Um like I mentioned, because we want to try and maximize our hydrocarbons, there's a lot of efforts to improve upon domestic production. Um of, of crude oil within the country and also domestic um, availability of petroleum products. Because we are aware that if we do not push ourselves to, to enhance our own capacity domestically, there isn't financing for hydrocarbon or hydrocarbon financing globally is shrinking. Okay, so for the petroleum sector, we're looking inward as much as possible to expand our domestic production. I hope that sort of settles it as much. I, I'm not sure if I, properly understand the question, but if, if we haven't answered it well, you can actually ask again. Claire. Okay. I think I think it was more about uh, a question about demand and whether, you know, um, we'll make sure that we can, we are meeting, you know, increased demand for electricity, actually, because of the use, oh. because of extraction of critical materials. So as you, as you said, it's not, um, it's not, as as related, yeah. Yeah. Um. So I'd like to. We're getting lots of questions from the younger generation on on how they can build the necessary skills to participate in, in the energy transition. Um. I don't know if you'd like any of you would like to touch on that uh, very briefly, um. And then we can move on. Thank uh -huh. you. So I don't want to own the have a monotony on, on youth because I'm not the owner of youth, but I can I can touch on that as well. Um, yeah. I would say, depending on what stage of your career that you're in, maybe start by, if you don't, if you don't have a clear entry the idea or an idea of entry, maybe start by volunteering. Um, I know that's mm -hmm. not the preferable option for most of the time. I know things are tough, so we all like to be paid for our work, but that's an easy way to just get your foot in the door um, with less hesitance from maybe uh, an employer or whatever. If you know somebody in the police, maybe try and volunteer to maybe work as an assistant or something in someone's office. I did that for a bit before I got my role as well. Um, you know somebody who works in the police, speak to them about mentorship. I did mention that earlier as well. Um, other things you can do are attend seminars, webinars like this, just getting more information um, but ultimately, we do we do exist in society, and so if you know somebody, it's usually easier to you know, make an ask about how you can get involved. There are internships available as well. We, for instance, had a STEM trainee um, program that we were running last year for females in STEM. So we had about four graduates from different institutions joining us. Um, as as interns here and now one of them is actually like with us permanently as well. so if you look go on linkedin ask within the sector there's usually a number of opportunities available i would say um i would like to add to that um bradley so a critical thing you must have is you must look at the skills that are needed for the sector. You you can't just have you know skills that are unrelated and and expect that you get opportunities easily within the sector. So besides wanting to do mentorship, besides wanting to do internship or you know um, um, learning from some experts, you should at least make sure you gather the skills. And so right from um, the education curriculum, one of the plans in the energy transition plan is to try and incorporate it within the education curriculum. So you build the interest 
in the education curriculum, you want to be a renewable energy expert, you must have some programs um, um, that build you up in that in that area. When you're doing your um, engineering programs and all of that, you must pick an interest in renewable energy and build yourself in along along those lines. So it's not enough to just want to be mentored and 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 groomed, but have the re relevant skills that can place you within those jobs. Okay. And if I can also just give back off um, jobs comments, if you don't have those skills, for instance, don't also feel like you there's no space for you because we also have other work streams within the energy sector. So, for instance, I'm going to shout out um, someone on our team, both, both our interns, Jacqueline and Desiree, who are with us. And they have different skill sets. For, for instance, Jacqueline is technical and Desiree is not. So, but Desiree has skills in like corporate and marketing and that kind of thing and energy companies also rely a great deal on that too so if you feel like oh i'm not technical how will i fit in there are different job functions also within yeah. the energy space um, yes. available to you okay. well we're, we're getting ready to wrap up this session um i mean at least this section of of our session uh there are a couple of questions that came up that i i just can't pass up on so I'll, I'll let, um, they're targeted at either, you know, I'll, this time I'll be specific as to who it's targeted to. And then I'll let you give a, uh, brief, some brief closing remarks and then um, we'll end um, this uh, panel session. So um, the first question um, is, in fact, there are two of them that are related that have to do with, with finance. So um, one person asks, what is the plan to increase the amount and make the cost of domestic finance affordable in order for us to be able to fund some of the transition initiatives. So that was um, one related to, to finance. And then, um, yeah, there's another one I, I'm missing that. But anyway, so Bradley, I thought maybe you could you could take that one. Okay, sure. So if I'm speaking from the perspective of the transition and investment plan, the ATIP, it kind of advocates for blended finance options and um, a number of de-risking instruments that can help to reduce perceived investment risk and attract private capital. So like anything from guarantees to um, securitization, grants, I'll, I'll touch on grants specifically. Um, we basically have a number of donor partners, not only just like the traditional ones like GIZ and um, the, the national based ones, but also philanthropic capital. So for instance, we work quite closely with Bloomberg Philanthropies, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, IKEA Foundation, et cetera. And what we try to do there is to get some of these philanthropic organizations to uh, offer some funding that we can use to reduce the impact of, um, how do you say it? Reduce the, the burden on some of these companies. So for instance, if the Rockefeller Foundation, for instance, is offering a $10 million for solar in Africa, they are not a typical financier in the traditional sense, they have different um, payback options. Their, their metrics are different. They are looking for more of an ESG return on investment as opposed to just getting their money back. So they do have lower interest rates or sometimes if it's, it's a grant, for instance, zero, zero interest, just a grant, just payback when you're done. And so that's pretty helpful. We've had success with that and more projects around the world as well. And so, you know, kind of, bringing together all those options, looking at what um, philanthropic capital is available, something that we've been trying to do as well. So, yeah, it's global it's, finance is a tool that we, we hope will help to achieve this. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think at this point, uh, yeah, did you want to touch on it as well, Sheila? I thought I heard you. Oh, okay, yes. Um, I'm aware that there are some green funds actually circulating within the country. I'm aware that there are some commercial banks that have some of the green funds available as loans for renewable energy projects. Um, there's a particular bank that I know who's 
open to providing loans for solar energy projects and all of that. So they can, there's a way to access them locally as well through um, these commercial banks. As long as you're showing proof that it's a renewable energy project, fortunately, we've, we've been able to pull some of these funds into the country. And even internationally as well. Um, the, the baby for funding nowadays is if it is green, if it's green energy and all of that. So it shouldn't be difficult to access um, funding for, for green energy projects. Yeah, that's very true, Sheila. I had the opportunity to sit for a brief period of time in a sustainability summit that was um, sponsored by Fidelity Bank and um, right. BNFT a couple of days ago. And I was amazed at, at yes. what was going on with that. I wasn't aware at all at, about how much uh, they were involved in that. So, I mean, at this point, um, I think I'll, I'll just give both of you, if you want, um, just a um, couple seconds to give some closing remarks. Um, I know uh, some of you had a, have a hard stop at noon, um, and then I'll, I'll let uh, um, Gideon um, Ayu will come in uh, with some closing remarks. So, um, Sheila, you want to go first? <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Eunice. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. I think that my, my position, I'm a bit um, skewed towards making sure we have a just energy transition, maybe because of the predisposition of the subsector within which I work. Um, you cannot have a hard stop at a certain year in terms of energy transition without considering making sure you reduce energy poverty or you eliminate energy poverty. And what is energy poverty? We've, Ghana has done very well in terms of electricity access. We're close to 90% or so in terms of countrywide electricity access. But in terms of clean cooking fuel, we are not there yet. And so you still need to close that gap. You have to close that gap with some transition fuels. And we've decided that gas in the country is a transition fuel. So whilst we're looking at these energy renewable energy targets, we still must trumpet gas as much as possible, which is, and the reason why gas is chosen as a transition fuel, even in the energy transition framework is that it is the lowest emitting hydrocarbon um, um, that we have. And so, as much as possible, we should be able to transition. I think we cannot be under international pressure, yet we still need to be alert, okay? We cannot be under international pressure whilst we still have our economy undeveloped. But I'm not saying we shouldn't still be aware of the global impacts of transition on us. So that's, that's, that's what I'm closing with. We must transition at Ghana's pace, still being aware of the, of the impacts. And I think we're doing very well um, with that combination. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. Uh, Bradley, please, <laughs> please go ahead. Thanks, Eunice. Um, once again, thank you so much for having us. Um, I was pretty excited to join this panel, and I think it was fantastic so far. If I could close on any particular point, I would say, you know, having sat from the government perspective and now another perspective, which is more, you know, closer to the donors, what I would say is that that cross-collaboration that we were speaking about earlier is super important. Um, sometimes we think we are speaking different languages, but I've realized that we actually all want the same thing at the end of the day. And so it's super important for us to continuously engage. And that's why, you know, um, platforms such as what you're offering right now are fantastic because they're putting together government, international partners, and an audience who come from various sectors to address, you know, several concerns that we have about our transition. And it's fantastic. Um, so Continued cross collaboration is super important, and my office is here to be a conduit for that. Um, we are always open to further engagement um, to see how best we can address some of your concerns as well. So, thank you once again for having us. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bradley. Honestly, and Sheila, pleasure was all ours. So, at this point, um, I'll turn things over to Gideon Ayu, um, Energy resources and industrials industry leader for Deloitte um, to give us a few closing remarks and we'll bring a webinar to an end. Thank you. Okay. 
Gideon, you are muted. Can you unmute, please? You are muted. Sorry. Um, I think uh, I also wanted to say thank you to uh, Bradley and Dr. Sheila for their presence here. And then uh, it's it's good hearing your insights and for somebody, people coming from the field and sharing that, we really appreciate that very much. I think one of the questions which came in earlier and I wanted to touch uh, that in terms of their skills and somebody was asking what areas can they uh, assist. I think uh, there's, it's, since it's a new area, there's, there's a lot of opportunities available. And one of the areas now is the uh, new EVs coming in. And uh, when you look around, there's basically nothing, uh, lack of support available. And I think for anybody who would, or whatever the plan is, I think there should be some rescaling or retooling of uh, mechanics. Uh, to be able to repair these vehicles or provide support for them. I think it's a major area. If this can be tackled very well, it's a major opportunity for employees, uh, for employment to be created. And I think another question came on what is uh, Deloitte uh, doing in terms of the energy? I think for us, we are main, mainly consultants. Uh, we provide advice services to the sector or industry, and we do things such as what we've done today. And so it's an area that if you are interested in, um, you, you can apply and then uh, we'll take a look. It's not just energy focused, but we look for various skills and backgrounds and we can do that. Um, I, I, I think for uh, me, the lessons learned today, uh, specifically with regards to uh, energy poverty and that for countries like us, we are not just transitioning, we are trying to bridge the gap. And so whichever uh, sources of energy will be available to enable us to bridge this gap is what we are looking at. So whether it's coming from fossil fuels or it's coming from directly clean energy, it's an area that we cannot forget about or we cannot overlook. Uh, we have to first bridge the gap and then we have to then look at taking the subsequent steps. Uh, having said this, we cannot also overlook the fact that the world is changing. Uh, ICU vehicles, for example, will become a thing of the past. And unless we can say we are going to produce our own vehicles, EVs are going to come in and then we need to be ready to support this area. So the car batteries, energy storage, uh, off-grid, these are areas that we have to look at. And one of the benefits of renewables or transitioning to this energy is that it allows us to decouple from the uh, global energy stream so that we are not so vulnerable to energy uh, price swings. As of now, whenever uh, crude oil prices go up, it affects the whole economy. And so if we're able to uh, have access to solar, to uh, renewable from wind, and even to the nuclear that the energy minister uh, uh, alluded to earlier, this will provide some uh, uh, balance against the external shocks that we've been uh, having frequently. So it's whether we like it or not, it's an area that, that, that we are going on to. And then uh, Dr. Sheila mentioned the fact that um, we, sh we we are not trying to overbalance or uh, in terms of the just energy, uh, in terms of having uh, women take over. But I I don't think it's a problem now. Men have been in charge all this while, so we shouldn't mind at all if women take over for a while. I think it's it's also part of the justness, uh, uh, just by the way. So we, we've we, I've learned a lot in terms of the uh, national energy transition framework, the investment uh, uh, framework as well, and the fact that. There have been various policy options. Maybe we haven't looked at it or from where we stand out. We haven't seen it totally as an energy transition plan. But in terms of using gas, uh, for example, it's part of it. And we can remember this started in the eight, late 80s to 90s that all families started moving towards cylinders. Of course, the, the, there is uh, still way to go, but this has been going on for a while in our uh, e e e economy. Also, the fact that we've since uh, certain acts from the government in terms of uh, using EVs, for example, uh, the recent budget which was read, there's been tax uh, incentives provided now. So for anybody who wants to import uh, uh, transportation, public transportation using EV, th there, there is a drop against uh, import duties as well. So th this, I will need to see more of it, but you can see infant steps being taken in these areas for government to back up all this uh, energy transition framework that we have. Um, it's been good engagement, engaging, and then we hope to have more of such engagement with you, uh, Bradley and Sheila, and then uh, to the wider community. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Eunice, over to you.
Thank you very much, uh, Gideon. Um, and um, just the final note uh, from, from me is please do scan um, the QR code. We'd like to hear um, your feedback on this webinar. Uh, we, we're at Deloitte, we believe in continuous improvement. So uh, please do, um, we wanna hear from you. Uh, we thank you very much for um, being part of, of, uh, of our discussion today. And uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody that's participated, especially uh, to the members of, of my team from the energy consulting team. Uh, just to put in a, a quick plug uh, for us, uh, we're part of uh, Deloitte Consulting uh, here in, in the Ghana office. And um, we have several other um, advisory roles that we play. Um, so please look us up. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. And it uh, really was a pleasure having you all uh, join us uh, this, this morning. Uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. <laughs> Hi, right, Benjamin. Hi, are, are we back to, is this our internal? Um, no, are we back no, to our internal? You can, you can drop them. Yeah, okay. I, okay, I hope you did. I hope everybody didn't hear me ask. How can I leave? <laughs> they heard you. You said they did? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, the whole world. Hell, oh, my goodness. Okay. We're, we're going to have to... There's some things we'd like to discuss as part of our post-webinar uh, 